Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. Please stand for our first hymn, hymn number 121, hymn number 121. everyone and welcome to the fourth Sunday after Pentecost and also we should be very glad we have our organ. <laughs> um, right so we're starting on page 119 of the green prayer book and uh, for those who are unfamiliar. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The sentence for today, those who find their life will lose it and those who lose their life for Jesus' sake will find it. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of
The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, chapter 10, beginning at the 24th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A disciple is not above a teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Bilzal, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground unperceived by your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foe will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For the gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And please be seated. And let me pray. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, the understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Albert Einstein once said, he probably said it more than once, but Albert Einstein said, only two things are infinite. The universe and human stupidity. I'm not sure about the former. Now, I bet each of us have plenty of stories to prove Albert Einstein right, um, usually to deal with bureaucracy, with Centrelink or some other government department that seems to just be full of stupid rules you've got to follow and stupid hoops you've got to jump through. Um, but I don't even need to look that far afield. I know in my own life, there are plenty of times when I've made stupid decisions when looking back, I think, what were you thinking? And when we think about it a bit more, when we look in God's word, we also find plenty of times where people do frankly stupid things. Think of King David, the greatest king Israel ever had. What did he do? Sinned with Bathsheba, killed her husband to cover it up. His son Solomon, supposedly the wisest man to ever live. What did he do? Married 700 women, 
and let them drag him away from God's faithful word. And this morning, we see Abraham and Sarah, that first couple of God's people, make some foolish and stupid choices. But we also see that Albert Einstein did get it wrong. There is only one thing that is infinite, and that is God. He's greater than us. He's greater even than our sin, greater even than our foolish stupidity. And we see this morning as we look at Abraham and Sarah that God answers human foolishness with grace. He will keep his word, no matter how foolish we behave. He promised Abraham and Sarah a son. He promised them blessing. He promised them a great land and nothing that anyone ever does will ever get in the way of his promises. God will keep his word, no matter how foolish Abraham and Sarah are. Not even when they don't seem to learn, not even when they keep making the same mistakes over and over again. That's their problem in this part of Genesis. They keep making the same mistakes they've made before. They don't learn from the past. See, look what Sarah does. God has been unbelievably gracious to Sarah, remember? He has given her a son when she was 90. Now, I don't think I'd think that was gracious if God gave my wife a son when she was 90. But Abraham and Sarah did. God promised them a son, and she gives birth to Isaac, the son of the covenant, the son of the promise, Abraham's true and legitimate heir, simply because God said he would. And so he does. And God continues to bless and watch over his people. Isaac grows, and it's time for him to be weaned. And now, of course, that Abraham, that, sorry, Isaac is finally about three years old. Abraham and Sarah throw a great big party to celebrate. It's full of rejoicing and happiness, except for one person. Ishmael stands off to the side and mocks his little brother. See, before Isaac was born, Ishmael was the heir. Ishmael was the one who stood to inherit everything that Abraham had. But now he can see it being taken away by this three-year-old boy. No wonder he stands there and mocks his little brother. Just imagine, can't you, um, this 16-year-old surrounded by his mate standing off to the side just saying, yeah, let's celebrate, he said, let's throw a massive party. This brat's managed to feed himself finally. Oh, isn't he such a great kid? His parents must be so proud. Well, Sarah, she's not happy at all. She's never really cared for Hagar. And now she just wants this woman and her son gone. She's jealous for her son, as she was a few chapters ago. And so she says to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. She can't even bring herself to use their names. She doesn't want anything to come between Isaac and his inheritance, his birthright. But the lesson that Sarah hasn't learned is that she doesn't need anything she doesn't need to do anything to protect God's promises her very son Isaac who's sitting next to her should be all the proof she needs that God keeps his promises God said they would have a son he's Isaac God said that Isaac is the son of the promise that God that Isaac is the one who Abraham will in, that will inherit from Abraham that Isaac is the heir he promised and what God says he does doesn't need Sarah to try to make sure that it actually comes true, but instead, Sarah, overcome by her jealousy, makes the mistake of thinking the ends justify the means. And so she wants Abraham to drive Hagar and her son far away. And now Abraham doesn't know what to do. He loves his son Ishmael. For 13 years, that was his one and only son. He loves his son, but he loves his wife. He knows Isaac is the child of the promise. He doesn't know what to do. What would you do? 
I don't know what I would do. Well, thankfully, God comes into this broken family, graciously steps in, speaks, and begins to pick up the pieces and fix the mess that Abraham and Sarah have made of their lives. So Abraham sends Hagar and Ishmael off. They wander in the desert. Their water runs out. They lay down, about to die. But God comes to Hagar and makes her great promises and saves her and her son in the midst of the wilderness. Why? Because that's what he promised to do. Way back in chapter 16, he promised that Ishmael would become a great nation in his own right. And nothing is going to stop him from keeping his word. Not Ishmael mocking the child of the promise. Not Sarah's jealous rage. Not a lack of water in the wilderness. God will keep his promise to Abraham. His promise to Hagar. Because he is faithful. He keeps his promises. It's true for Sarah. It's true for Hagar, and it's true for Abraham. If you go back to chapter 20, just the chapter, just the chapter right before the one we read, do you know what Abraham does? He goes down and he's scared that people will steal his beautiful wife, his beautiful 90-year-old wife, don't forget. And so he says to her, tell people that you're my sister. And Sarah finds herself in the harem of Abimelech. And that's the second time. Abraham has entrusted God enough with his wife. The second time he's told Sarah to say she is his sister. And the second time he has tried to trust himself rather than trusting in God's promises. But even his foolishness of making the same mistake over and over again, of never learning, does not stand in the way of God's promises. What God says he will do. Even if Abraham keeps making the same mistakes over and over again. Even if Sarah keeps making the same mistakes over and over again. What God says he will do even when we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. We've all got those sins, don't we? That we keep falling into over and over again. Those sins that when we fall into them and ask for forgiveness, we say, that's it, that's the last time, I'm not going to do that again. And it might last for a day or a week, maybe a month, sometimes merely an hour, till we find ourselves doing it again. There are times we just can't seem to help ourselves. But God can. And God does. Even in those times when we feel like our sin is bigger than we are, it's not bigger than God. See, God's faithfulness is so amazing, so huge, that it overcomes all our sin. There is no sin that stands in the way of his word, no level of human foolishness that nullifies his great promises. Don't believe me? Look at Abraham and Sarah. God blessed them over and over and over again. He kept his word, no matter how foolish and stupid they were, no matter what mistakes they made, no matter how much they fell into the same sins over and over again, God kept his word. He did what he promised. He will do what he has promised his people. He has promised that he will save all who call on the name of his son. He's promised that he will save all who name Jesus as their Lord. He has promised to save all who trust that God raised him from the dead. That is a promise that God will keep. That's a promise that is bigger than even our foolish sin. Even when we make the same mistakes over and over again, God is faithful and always keeps his word. Let me pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are faithful even when we are not. We confess that we don't always follow your word and we thank you that in your son you grant us forgiveness and eternal life in him. Father, when we do fall and sin, please help us to turn to you in trust and repentance, knowing that your grace and your promises are so much greater than us and our sin. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Gracious God, we thank you in this sacrament, you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and help us to grow in love and obedience, that we may serve you in the world, and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. And please stand for our final hymn, hymn number 571, hymn number 571. peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.